everybody, and happy Thursday afternoon. It's about lunchtime here in New York City. Um, so for those of you who are on the East Coast, thank you for spending your lunch with us. And on the West Coast, thank you for spending your morning with us. For everybody, we're just really happy that you're here and that you found your way to join us today on Stamol Live. I am Erica Rand Silverman, and I am a literary agent at Stamola Literary Studio. I represent um, authors and illustrators of children's books. And you have joined us on Stamola Live, uh, where we bring authors to you real time. And today we're going to be having a conversation around early readers, uh, emerging readers, beginning readers. Uh, you may have heard them called all of those, and every publisher seems to have their own line of them. Uh, I'm, this is, pers for, personally for me, a really exciting conversation because when you work in children's publishing, I think we can probably all agree that one of the things we are most passionate about is developing readers and giving children the love of reading uh, for the rest of their lives. And when we're talking about emerging readers, beginning readers, uh, we're talking about capturing them at that very young age, preschool and kindergarten and first grade, creating books that give them uh, the autonomy and the confidence to be able to read books on their own. And it's especially exciting to have Vikram Madan and his editor, Sally Morgridge from Holiday House here talking about the Owl and Penguin series, since not only do I know that these books are amazing and hilarious and so sweet, uh, but the ALA Award Committee agrees and the books uh, were awarded in a Geisel honor. So we're going to learn today the stories behind those books and really look at and talk about why these books succeed for our youngest readers. And I think this is important for any of you who are interested in making these books yourselves or teachers who are using these books or parents who are using these books with kids. So I'm going to bring in Vikram and Sally. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you giving the time out of your day and the preparation that you took to, to do this. I'm very excited. Thank you for having us. So before I step away and let Vikram and Sally take it away for a bit, I do want to remind everybody that probably most of you are here because you already subscribed to the Simola Live newsletter. And that's how I often tell people about events. But sometimes we do have events or we do have content that we don't share in the newsletter. Uh, and that content goes directly onto the YouTube channel. And so if you don't want to miss that information, then you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel directly. And there's a button right below down there somewhere that you can check so that you will be subscribed and not miss anything. And if for some reason you're here from a friend and you don't subscribe to the newsletter, you can go to stimolalive.com and plug in your email there. We only send out newsletters when we have events. That's it. So, all right, that's my spiel. And uh, we'll get to the good stuff now. And Vikram and Sally, I'll let you begin. Okay. Uh, we have a little presentation here that we'll be using. And you need me to put it on? I might have to. Okay, go ahead. All right. There, there we go. go. So, um, so hello everybody, I'm Vikram Madan. I am an author and illustrator and also a visual artist. I live in Seattle and uh, Owl and Penguin is my early beginning reader, pre-reader comic under the Holiday House. I like to read comics line and um, Sally is my editor. So uh, today we're just going to tell you about how this book came together. Hi, I'm Sally Morgridge. Um, I feel very lucky to be Vikram's editor and to be here with you all today. And so for those of you who might not have seen the book, I just wanted to show what the inside looks like. It's a comic with um, uh, very few words and uh, a lot of, you know, 
uh, hopefully visual interest for little kids who are just uh, getting into reading. And uh, I was just going to uh, say, Vikram, before we move further, I, it occurs to me, I mean, I gave a tiny bit of information, but I feel like there might be a lot of people watching who don't know a lot about this format. You know, there's board books, which are like the little hard books, and there's picture books, which are the bigger sort of picture book format. Then there are these early readers, and they, they tend to be, you can see from the cover, they're taller and thinner. And then you go on to middle grade chapter books, middle grade YA. Um, but Sally was telling us a really interesting story. I don't know if you're comfortable sharing, but it's yeah, sort of how early readers got going at Holiday House. Sure. So early readers have been a lot around for a long, long time. Of course, Dr. Seuss, Theodore Seuss Geisel, um, really broke into the market in the 1950s. Um, and I, I, you know, in preparation for today, I was reading more about how the Cat in the Hat came together, and it, it's not so unlike how we approached adding words to Owl and Penguin, which I found interesting. They were looking at a list of, I think like 220 vocabulary words and, and limiting the text in The Cat in the Hat to those, to those words. Um, but Holiday House's line of early readers and early reader comics are called I Like to Read and I Like to Read Comics. And we saw a bit of a gap in the market back in 2010. Um, for the very earliest readers or kids who are just wanting to read independently or maybe even struggling to read independently and need to build a bit more confidence. My colleague Grace Macaron had seen this um, with her daughter, so, who's now an adult my age, but had, had always wanted to, Grace worked at Scholastic for many years, Scholastic has their own line, um, but saw a need still in 2010 for those very earliest reading levels. Um, for example, The Cat in the Hat is a level J on the Fontes and Pinnell um, A to Z guided reading levels. Frog and Toad, another kind of classic early reader, is a level K. Um, so I Like to Read was developed with guided reading levels A through G as the goal. Um, I like to read comics. We're not leveling them. Um, we're not including the the guided reading level on the cover as we do for I like to read. You can see this one's a level A. It's so hard to write a level A. <laughs> Paul Mizell is another one of our guys honorees um, on the Holiday House list who is able to do what Vikram does so well, tell a story with very, very few words, um, repeating vocabulary, extremely simple vocabulary with the idea that these books should be supporting emerging readers, reinforcing what they know and instilling a love of stories, a love of reading as, as Erica was, was speaking to, you know, that's what the goal of the format should be. Um, so I Like to Read Comics was born out of I Like to Read because we saw yet again with the growing popularity of graphic novels, a gap in very, very young um, graphic novels. And I think sequential storytelling is, is particularly great for early readers because kids can really follow the storyline through panels, you know, facial expressions are really focused on sound effects and so on. Um, so it, it's just, it, it seems inevitable that, that, that we would be doing the same thing in graphic novel format. Uh, and it was incredibly fortuitous that Vikram, that Owl and Penguin came to me as a wordless book because Vikram and I were able to start with that uh, strong visual storytelling and work together, which he is now going to continue telling us about the process. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I thought I'd take a few moments to talk about the origin story behind this book, which is uh, completely unintuitive. And um, one of the most frequent questions I get when I'm talking to audiences is, where do you get your ideas? And I keep telling people ideas evolve. You know, it's rare that you get the spontaneous brain flash. Uh, usually you're working with something and it turns into something else. So the story for Owl and Penguin goes back about 10 years. I was in a painting class. I was learning how to use oil paints for the first time. And I had this really pristine white panel and I happened to drop a little bit of oil paint on it. 
and I tried to smear this, wipe it away, and instead it just smeared into a circle. And I didn't want to throw my panel away, and I couldn't clean it, so I turned that circle into a face, and I produced this painting. This was a little painting of a elf like guy holding a cup of coffee. And I was pretty pleased with myself for having saved my panel from going to waste. And so I went down to the coffee shop next to the art school and I said, hey, you put art up, would you put this art up in your coffee shop? And they said, yes, but we need four paintings. So we can't just put up one. So I went back and I made four paintings. And uh, these are all four coffee-themed paintings. One's called, what do you mean it's decaf? One's called Return of the Coffee Fairy. One's called Gliss. And one's called Oh, the Humanity. So it took me a couple of months to do this because I was very new and struggling at this. And so I took them back to the coffee shop and discovered the coffee shop had changed owners and they no longer wanted to hang these paintings in the coffee shop. So I was pretty dejected. I... Um, Looked around, I found another coffee shop and I went to them and said, hey, will you put these paintings up? And they said, yes, but we need 24. We can't put four paintings up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so back I went, uh, spent many more months creating 24 paintings. And finally I got mad. This was my first actual live show in the real world where I got to put art up in a place where the public could see it. And these paintings were kind of popular. I didn't sell any of them in the show. Uh, people loved looking at them, but nobody wanted them. Um, but in this set was this one painting called Iced Coffee, which had this little penguin drinking coffee next to this person drinking coffee. And people seemed to like this one. I sold a lot of prints of this painting. And eventually, um, somebody asked me if I would paint a painting for them that had maybe two cute penguins in it or a penguin or some other bird in it. And they called out this other uh, watercolor I had made of a robot and an owl sitting on a tree. And this person said, make me a commission painting for my husband and just see if you can combine these birds in some way sitting on a branch. And so I, I turned these two characters into this painting called Birds of a Feather, an owl and a penguin sitting on a branch. So this is the first occurrence of owl and penguin. Would not have happened without me dropping that drop of paint on my panel. And so people seem to like this painting a lot. So I ended up uh, you know, doing some recurring paintings with the same characters in them. And eventually an editor I was working with, and that's not Sally, uh, an editor I was working with <laughs> asked me if uh, I'd considered writing a story about these guys. Uh, and I had not, but I thought, why not? So I thought I would try and put a picture book together about friendship. So I, I, I went off, I have a slightly analytical side. So I went off and spent, I think, six months reading about friendship and all its forms. <laughs> and I try to come up with this rhyming picture book and I'm going to show, show you a few spreads. And the idea was these two characters are friends and they kind of go through adventures. And I was trying to call out what is it that allows two people who are very different to be friends. And it really comes down to if you have to be a little bit different and you have to be a little bit same, too different and too same, you're not going to be very strong friends. You kind of have to have that overlap, but just the right amount. And so I was sketching all these ideas for this picture book. Um, and so here's one where they're, you know, one enjoys rain, one enjoys sunshine. And in that process, they have an experience. Um, there was another spread here where they were correcting each other and helping them learn and then having a disagreement and resolving that uh, in a way. And I packaged this together as a picture book dummy and I sent it to the editor and she <laughs> turned it down. <laughs> Um, she felt they were, they, I didn't have enough of the narrative arc in there and um, she felt the characters needed more development and that was true because at this point I hadn't quite developed these characters fully, their personality was a little generalized and uh, I was a little dejected, you know, I spent a fair amount of time looking into 
doing this project, doing this dummy. And that's just part of the process when you're writing and illustrating is you're going to have proposals that will get turned down. Um, but in that proposal, I kept coming back to the sequence of images where owl and penguin have a disagreement. They both want to do something that the other person doesn't want to do. And I felt there was some potential in this wordless sequence of telling a story. So I wondered what if I turned this wordless sequence into a short comic format um, book, a comic format story. And so I, I went and I tried to sketch out a few panels and these characters. And I had this three page spread. So you see on the first page, the two are running to each other. Owl wants to play soccer, Penguin wants to play tennis, and then they can't agree. And they're just basically being grumpy at each other till they have this brain flash, which never happens in real life and end up playing this hybrid game. And so I took this panel and I kind of uh, posted it on Instagram and I asked my Instagram followers what, you know, would they, would they be interested in stories that had no words and would, were told entirely through pictures like this. And I was really surprised, uh, you know, most of my Instagram posts don't get any response, but this one generated a lot of uh, response from people. The um, people said they would, they liked a lot of things about this short sequence, including the fact that if a kid did not know how to read, they could look at this uh, these images and kind of follow the story. So pre-readers, uh, if they had struggling readers who were apprehensive about books because they had trouble with the words, um, this would help them broach the 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 fear that they had with books. Um, I got responses from multilingual families. They said, oh, we love having stories that aren't in one language so that we could read them with our kids in both in all the languages we speak at home. And so, so I thought there was something there because people, there were a lot of, it seemed that there were a lot of audiences um, being left out by a more traditional book. So the pre-readers, the struggling readers, the English as a second language readers, uh, the multilingual families. And so I uh, thought maybe there's something here. So I sent this to uh, Rosemary, who's my agent and founder of the Stimola Literary Studios. Um, she <clears throat> thought this, the, this could be something. So her primary uh, feedback was this is too complex. Uh, if you're going for a younger age group, if you're looking at that pre-reader age group, you kind of need to simplify this down. There's too much detail, there's too much clustering, and too much uh, too much information is being communicated here. You have to tone that down a little bit. So I tried again, and so this is my second version at that owl and penguin story. We're simplifying the characters, simplifying the 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 images, um, and reducing the density and more panels, open panels, a lot of uh, background, clear background space. And so that three page story um, is now working. I turned that into a seven page story. So here, so giving them just more room to express themselves and having more repetition of the idea. So in terms of laying out the story, if for those who are curious about doing the graphic novel format, you as a creator have a lot of control on the timing and the pacing and what you want to show and how you want to show. You're literally almost like a movie director. You can kind of dwell on a scene forever and pour the audience to tears, or you can have things go by so fast that people are left scratching their head, what happened here? Um, and so there's a little bit of finding a balance between showing too much and showing too little, going too fast, going too slow, and what do you focus on, what do you show? And I think the best way to develop a sense for that is to read a lot of graphic novels, which I think I've been doing since I was three years old. Um, so, um, so this story proceeds. They have their disagreement. They walk away from each other. They come back and they are happy to have a, the same idea. And then they go and do their um, hybrid game. 
and so so this format format so so Ro was really uh, Rosemary was really good at uh, her feedback was on point and that the earlier format is just too crowded uh, it's, it's hard to decipher what's going on unless you spend a lot of time looking at the panels um, whereas for a younger audience this would definitely be an easier format to uh, look at and absorb and one thing I realized as I was doing this format is I didn't quite like these characters' personalities. They're a little belligerent, they're a little angry at each other, they're not willing to compromise easily, and they're kind of stubborn and insistent on doing their own thing. And in a way, they're almost identical characters in the sequence. Um, so the characters were still developing at this point and hadn't quite reached the final form, but the act of making this was kind of helping me figure out who was who. Um, and so I sent this back to my agent, Rosemary, and she said that, she, you know, she said it's definitely better, but she was kind of skeptical about the whole wordless concept. Um, she felt that would be difficult to put in the market, uh, that a lot of editors would have trouble with the wordless format, um, the whole idea of selling books to readers is difficult if readers have nothing to read in them, um, that parents and book purchasers, the adults who buy the books, generally shy away from wordless books. They prefer words. But to her credit, she was still willing to let me run with this idea and, and see where it goes. And so uh, this is where I then go from the dummy to start actually thinking about developing an actual project. And so um, in that picture book dummy I had done back then, there were a lot of sketches. And I found I could just mine those sketches for ideas for stories. So there were ideas for you know about them having music, liking ice cream, flying, swimming, playing in the rain. And so I, I used that as my source. And then I started developing uh, stories around them. And so uh, this is what my sketches looked like. So I would sketch out the story for Alan Penguin. Um, and I try to keep the sketches really loose. I think this is just the pro thumbnail process of creating any book is you just want to sketch things quickly because they tend to be livelier and more organic than if you try to work them in detail. And so just working with a simple black and white, not adding too much detail um, and trying to see again what the pacing is, where page turns happen, what happens on one page versus the next page. Can you create a surprise for the reader or something unexpected that would make them want to go further into the story? Uh, that's So that's part of the planning process for the story. So I might try different panels and move things around and try to get the rhythm just right. And so this first story is from the first book. These are the rough sketches for it. It's about ice cream. And so basically I'll walk you through it. I'll get the ice cream, share it with Penguin. Penguin basically in excitement drops the ice cream, is unhappy, I'll tries to make Penguin feel better and hands over Owl's ice cream to Penguin and Penguin drops it again. And now they're both startled and happy. Owl is a little miffed and then they have a laugh and then Owl goes off and they buy two more ice creams. And that's the first version and that's not the version in the book. So, uh, so I tested this on a few people and they felt this last panel where Owl is, has a light bulb is talking about a light bulb. They thought Owl was preaching to Penguin and that Owl was just, um, you know, in a lecturing mode, they didn't like that sketch. And they also felt this transition from having dropped the ice cream to laughing was too easy. It was too simple. It was too quick. Um, that it might not happen that way. They might not get over this incident that easily. So I needed to rethink the sequence. So then I would go through a few more variations. So in this variation, Penguin's trying to say Penguin is a clown. And Sally hasn't seen this. <laughs> <laughs> so Penguin says, basically, I'm a klutz. And Al says, you're a klutz. And then they have a good laugh. And they um, go back to have ice cream. And nobody... That's pretty cute. 
I know we are sure this to understood what was going on without my yes, hands the subtitles. Like, what's that? Penguin's a clown? That's a clown? Who's the clown? <laughs> so I had to redo this sequence again. Um, so here's a third version where they still laugh about it, but they take a few moments to get there. And now the timing felt right that you know it would take a moment to realize this the the humor in the situation and then get over it and have a good laugh and so that's the version that uh, ends up in the in the story in the final story and so um when you're making these things like sometimes it's really hard to land an ending so in book two there is a sequence where Al plays music wins a prize and i could not for the life of me find a proper ending for this so there's one ending where, you know, they just are happy. They think each other, each of them is, the other person is great. And they end the story. There's another variation where I took out a panel. There's a third variation where Penguin tries to get Owl to perform on the big stage. But again, nobody really understood what I was trying to say there. So that's a challenge. This one was so tough. This was, yeah, this one was tough. Yeah, and then there was a fourth one where Penguin is so happy at our success that Penguin puts up posters around town to invite everybody to a big music party. But again, nobody could understand what was our Penguin doing. Was he selling Owl's instrument, putting for sale posters <laughs> all over town? So the, the final book has a different ending. Uh, I'm not going to show that here. So, uh, go so I actually had a checklist. This is again the, my analytical side to make sure every story met a certain threshold of friendship qualities. So those six months I spent looking at friendship helped me build this little chart. So it's important that friends share experiences, help each other, support, care, help friends achieve their goals. They find joy in friends' success or happiness. They have some shared interests. They like spending time together. They find common ground and they help push a friend past the resistance. So for me, it was important. Every story that goes into my proposal hit at least some of these um, metrics. So, um, so so, then I put together a dummy. And this is these are just the thumbnails of a dummy. If you're, people are curious what the dummies look like when they go on submission, I had maybe four spreads or three spreads that had finished art. And then the rest of the... Uh, book was all sketches and they were kind of color coded to differentiate the stories from each other and the proposal that went out was for a 64 page completely wordless book with about six owl and penguin stories and then that landed on sally's desk and sally will tell you what happens next <laughs> um yeah it was 64 pages and Something that I didn't mention about our I Like to Read comics collection is that they are all 40 pages with self ends, meaning that, you know, the end papers count as this is actually page two, page three. Um, so they're really 32 pages and they're all six by nine trim size. So I this came in and. I hardly ever get submissions for I like to read comics in that format. You know, I'll get something that's 64 pages, 96 pages, 40 pages. And I think, okay, this could be, this could work really well for I like to read comics, but how do we take this and turn it into a 40 page self-ended book? And is the artist willing to do that? So um, when Vikram, and Rosemary sent me this, I like to read comics was in very early stages. And I remember um, I sent Rosemary, who luckily knew about our I like to read list, and that had been pretty well established by then. Paul Mizell had received the guy salon or, you know, librarians and teachers loved the books um, for filling that gap in the market. So we had some success to, to show, but I like to read comics was really a new venture. And so I I said to Rosemary, here's what, what I envision. And I think by then I had I had decided that we would need some words. Um, that I loved Vikram's very visual style. And again, the, sequ the sequential nature of the art makes it even more approachable for an emergent reader, I think. 
But as he said, some of the stories were just a little bit too complex, even on iteration 10 or 15, you know, he went through so many versions. And many of them were almost entirely decodable, um, but not quite. So I had a vision to add some very, very simple sight words and to work within the limitations of pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade. Um, there, there are lists of, there are a variety of lists out there of sight words, and there you have it. Um, so I actually sent some of these lists to Vikram and I said, what can you do? You know, where can we add words um, from this list? And of course, I also needed to tell him that I like to read comics and I knew right away that I was working with someone very special because he asked like the savviest questions. Um, he came very prepared he was in a critique group with an author and illustrator that I had been working with for several years. And he didn't let on until about halfway through the, the, the video call. I said, you know, I have this example of Dear, I, I can't remember why I was referencing Dear Beast um, by Dory Butler and, and Kevin Atterbury, but I was, and he said, oh yeah, yeah, no, I have a copy right here. <laughs> and, um, you know, he was in a critique group with them. So I knew that, that Vikram was smart. And the question was, was he willing to add text to this and be a part of this somewhat unknown venture we were going into? And he was. And we did. So um, I have to say, it wasn't that simple, that easy as me saying yes. I was willing to add the words. Um, the The whole idea of doing wordless. So uh, you know, when I was growing up in India, I really wanted to be a cartoonist. And so I grew up looking at comics, looking at cartoons, looking at cartoonists. And it's kind of uh, I, you know every cartoonist kind of wants to tell the story without words because that's how they show off their uh, ability to communicate an idea through their drawing and composition and characters and everything else on the page. So so, um, so I was really keen on the wordless idea for a long yes. time. And uh, I think, but Rosemary was also right about editors are going to balk at... <laughs> Um, at, at the word listing. So she had, I think she might have submitted it to several folks at the same time. And at least a couple of them said, you know, wordless is difficult for us to deal with. We don't know what to do with it. Um, uh, but almost no one came back and said, would you consider adding words? Uh, well, <laughs> Sally did. <laughs> So, so people kind of assumed that if I had submitted it wordless, I was stuck to right. that. But I wasn't actually. I, I was, I was, and and this is, I think, what I enjoy working most with Sally is, you know, when she makes a suggestion, it's usually valid. <laughs> so, uh, so Sally sent me this list of three hundred most common sight words, and I'm reading this list, and my goodness, there's almost nothing in here that I can use, because you find words like ice cream are not in this list. I mean. Right. Happy is not in this list. Um, love is not in this list. So I can't oh, say yeah. nice words, like three out of four words are not in the list. So I was kind of stuck on this. Um, but what I ended up doing is I, I ended up sorting this alphabetically so I could actually go through it systematically to see what would work and mark out all the words that could work and then try and use them. And I think it, you know, we we began with this rather scientific analytical approach, and I'm I've never seen that friendship checklist you made, um, but it it's sort of similar. We we began with something rather strict, and then sort of loosened up. And I think, uh, especially because we're not uh, leveling, I like to read comics on the cover. It, it, you want the basic principles to be there, but there's a lot more freedom in the format. And I like the idea of nearly wordless. And I think that's something that um, I used in the acquisitions meeting when I brought the project. And I, I knew I wanted to acquire two books at once. So, you know, I had this 64 page dummy and I thought this is great because we can, I don't have to tell this artist sorry, we can only take three of these stories. We can 
you know, take these six stories and figure out how to make two books from them um, while still working within the confines of the I Like to Read format. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I just, I instantly knew that, that th this, these characters were, and the storytelling style were right for this series. So I, I knew I wanted to commit to the two books. That's not always something that an editor wants to do. That's not always something I want to do, but I felt really strongly. And I remember in the acquisitions meeting, someone said, well, if it's nearly wordless, how is this going to teach kids to read? Because that is sort of the vision behind I like to read and I like to read comics is like, how is this supporting their reading? And, you know, I'm not an educator. I am now a parent of a, a child who's learning to read, but my, my daughter was much younger then. And so I felt very passionately about this, but um, I didn't, I, I worried that I was wrong. I have to be honest, you know, I said, well, I think visual storytelling and visual literacy is a huge part of learning to read and decoding the facial expressions. And the way the dialogue in Owl and Penguin works, which you've probably caught on by now, you know, there are these little, like I, we call them like emoji style because that's fun sales speak to, to talk to consumers. But the speech balloons all have um, images in them. So Owl, we added sight words, but we decided early on that, you know, we weren't going to change a thing about Owl and Penguin's special language with each other and the way that that ideas are communicated within the story. Um, and I, just, to me, it was a no brainer that that is part of, of learning to read and learning to uh, follow a storyline. But it, it has been interesting. And of course, ALA <laughs> agreed. And, you know, I think there is some it's nice to have that reassurance that it wasn't just us who felt that this was going to support emerging readers. But I, I guess it's just a, how you look at learning to read and, and building the confidence. Um, but we always, we knew that we weren't going to add a lot of words because I liked the idea of being nearly wordless. And as Vikram said, like that, that speaks to families, especially who, have kids who are struggling or maybe are bilingual households. Um, it just kind of created a more special audience beyond just emerging readers. Right. And and partly my, you know, I always imagine this is the kind of book that even a kid who doesn't quite know how to read yet can read to their younger siblings um, and Absolutely. walk them through the pictures. That was always the image I carried in my head. And in the end, we did end up you know, there's only 11 books in that, 11 words in the book that are not on this list. Every single other word is on this list. So I was glad we were able to get, um, stick to this as close as possible, just to stay true, true to the um, uh, to the idea of beginning common sight words. And interestingly, uh, when I talked about this on Twitter once, I got criticized for having characters called Owl and Penguin because some educator said kids can't quite form those sounds. You should have used a, ha a cat and a rat. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that would not be this book. <laughs> it, no, it would, would be a, a different book. 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 <laughs> yes, about a cat and a rat. So, uh, so once we, and the other challenge here was uh, cleaving this into two books was that there was no clean way to do this because these weren't like 32 pages and 32 pages. This was like 64 pages of narrative and so part of the planning process was to take these stories and shuffle them around like a jigsaw puzzle and then play tetris with the panels and get them to squeeze into the assigned pages and i think that's one of the things um that's always one of the challenges with books is that the format is well defined and you have to kind of squeeze your content into it uh, and make sure it still works so we spend i think a few months uh, going through that process of figuring out what was going into book one and then what would go into book two. And then uh, that's where I started doing some actual drawing. I have a quick little time lapse here. Uh, I think Erica can turn that on. So most of the art, almost all the art for this book, I decided to do on my iPad using the Procreate app. And 
uh, I just like the flexibility of being able to move things around, turn them around, um, and work from anywhere. I think that's the one. The Procreate on the iPad has its own set of challenges. So I'm, it's not the perfect tool, but the fact that I can work you know, in a plane or waiting for something or standing in a line just gives me a lot of flexibility. So one of my design goals for Owl and Penguin was to try and give it an organic look. Um, so everything is kind of carefully hand drawn and there's levels and levels of- Very carefully, very, very careful. I feel like don't understate how hard you worked on every single panel. Yes, so so this little sketch took, it's about, I would say 40 minutes of drawing that you just saw in a minute. Um, and the um, and the other design principle I had for this book is that there is no white color used anywhere in this book except in the character's eyes. And I was very particular about that because I wanted to make sure that when you look at a page, your focus goes straight to their expression. That's, I feel like that's so successful. I mean, it's like so clear. That's like they're so bold and emotive. And I think it's all because of that was such a smart choice. Right. And yes, and we actually had a little bit of back and forth on that with the in the design process because <laughs> the word the captions would show up with a white background, and then I would say that's too white; it needs to be toned down. And then they would come back and say, "But we toned it down." And then they would you know, <laughs> we, we would argue about the color of the. Of the I cap. think it was book two. Book two. I think book one. It's like once you said it has to be this way, the designer caught on, and then book two, like. Something there was some glitch with Photoshop where he had like a preset setting, and uh, you know here we are thinking, oh, book two, the, the design process is going to be so much smoother because not that it was bumpy the first time, but you know Vikram was very meticulous as you can see with what goes into a single panel, um, and so we had to get everything right, and so th we're thinking book two will be smoother, and then. Uh, like this preset setting kept screwing with the whites of the, the captions and Vikram was like taking screenshots, doing like the uh, the it, dropper to extract those CMYK tones. And our designer was like, I'm just confused because I know you want the white to be only in their eyes, but I, we couldn't figure out what was going wrong for a little bit. And then, uh, and then we did. Yeah. So, here then is what the art for that first story that I was showing the sketches. And this is the art without the captions. The captions were added uh, layered on top. And so as you can see, there's no white on the page except in the eyes. And I try to keep the panels light and colorful just to keep it visually interesting for kids. Um, and then that's the whole first story. And then these are the end papers for the first book. Uh, originally, they were all in color, but I felt that color was too bright and I didn't want it to conflict with the rest of the book, so I toned it into sepia. And then um, here's a preview from book two, which is coming out soon in June of 2023. And uh, the one change I made from in my process from before is now I'm sketching much more loosely. I Before I was spending time on the sketches, uh, now I've found that the looser I sketch, the more I can stay uh, true to a livelier organic feel in my final art. So I, I just keep my original sketches very, very loose. And then there was a the process of um, deciding on a cover. And so here are some of the sketches I sent in. Maybe Sally can talk about how what the process is for for selecting what goes on the cover. Yeah, I remember um, the umbrella one was popular too. I think we narrowed it down to the umbrella and ice cream, and so ice cream. Say, say we who's we who's the we that does? Oh, it? okay, it's... good good question. Um, we have a weekly cover meeting where sales, marketing. Um, sub rights, so are someone selling uh, foreign rights or audio rights for a book, that everyone from different departments participates and they're all coming in with their own 
perspective and their own goal. But, um, and of course, an editor tends to want a cover that best tells the story or, you know, indicates what it's going to be about. But we also want a cover that will sell the book. Um, and ice cream, I remember I really liked the umbrella and I thought it showed the contrast between the characters really nicely. Like, um, Penguin likes to get wet and Owl doesn't. And and so I was kind of focused on that one. But in the end, the ice cream was just such a crowd pleaser. Who doesn't love ice cream? And you got a sense of the friendship between the two of them and the, the generosity in that story um, in a way that you, you don't get. Uh, with the umbrella. So ultimately I, I was on board. Uh, and I think the palette of the book, I, I remember when you were going back and showing those, those spreads um, and the light tones, I remember I described it in my pitch at acquisitions as Sherbert E, which of course is appropriate for a story about ice cream. Um, so it just, it was very appealing that the palette and the ice cream combined made for a really appealing cover sketch. It was pretty unanimous. Sometimes we have covers that, um, you know, some people hold a grudge about a year later because their cover wasn't chosen. But I think um, in the end, everyone felt really confident about the green one. Although we didn't leave enough room for the Geisel sticker, but we've made it work. <laughs> yeah, here's the Geisel sticker. Okay. We've actually gone back as we've reprinted the book and uh, slightly adjusted the art to leave uh, more space for the sticker. Uh, like you said, it's a good problem to have. Yes, the best. And so uh, here we have uh, some of the other team members. We could only wrestle up one photo. This is Chris, who's the designer. <laughs> Yes, Chris, who's, uh, you know, stood by as we figured out the whites of the eyes and the whites of the captions. And um, Chris is actually an artist himself and wrote an I Like to Read book, wrote and illustrated uh, called Cat Likes Red. So in many ways, Chris is the perfect designer to work on this project. And then, of course, the other team members, Kerry, who's a graphics editor, and Rebecca, the production editor. Thank you for your help here. And uh, so here's Owl and Penguin 1 and 2, and that original story where they can't agree on what to play is going to show up in book 2. And um, they have the best day ever, which is where that title comes from. Book 2 releases in June, and so we're excitedly looking forward to that. Yes. And there will be a third Owl and Penguin book, too. That so. is that is one of the questions, and we'll we'll get to everybody's questions. We we have some. Mm -hmm. are, are there any inside scoops that these people can hear about the next one? Well, uh, considering that I haven't written it yet, <laughs> I don't get to hear some inside scoops. Well, Sally doesn't know I haven't written it yet, but uh, the I'm fact that on it exists—that's you know, the. This is where the analytical side of me is going to spend a long time trying to think about what's what should go into it, and then I'll actually get down to doing it. It'll hopefully go much faster. So it's usually—I uh, used to be in grad school, so I have this problem that anytime I start a project, I feel inclined to spend a lot of time researching about it, <laughs> um, like it too much to time be, before it seems I to be actually. Working out. I think it's yeah. working out for you, Vikram. I think it's okay. So, um, yeah, we can take questions. I think we only have one more slide, which is to talk about our What's upcoming next? collaboration that's coming out in October, which uh, we're very excited about. It's also a graphic novel, but this one's in rhyme, and it's longer, 96 pages. And so it is, it is not within the I Like to Read comics yes, um, umbrella. So, and Zuni Tales is inspired by my dog, Zuni. So um, that'll be fun when it comes out. So we can take questions if anyone has questions. Otherwise, uh, thank you. I'm going to, just so we could see you a bit bigger, um, I'm going to put a question up, which is really an interesting and important question. Um, and I'm hoping we can then segue this. And I don't know which one you want to address first, this question or the one I'm about to pose, which is whether you're getting feedback from educators 
um, on using these books with emerging readers, Vikram, and in your experience in the classroom, seeing firsthand how kids are navigating reading with these books. So this is Amy's question. I wonder with the science of I wonder with the science of reading movement pushing for more phonics, more decodable readers has affected the early reader industry. For example, pushing for decodable words versus sight words. That's a really good question. And Vikram, certainly chime in if you have insight. I think um, now that we have a few seasons of I Like to Read Comics under our belt, uh, we hopefully will be able to get more feedback on whether one or the other is more needed in classrooms right now. I think there is a visible, um, yes, a, a, a trend toward pushing for more decodable texts. Um, and I guess it depends on the complexity of the story you're working with to begin with. Alan Penguin um, had no words. And so we pushed for really, really basic sight words rather than focusing on phonics. But a lot of the I like to read comics and the I like to read proper books are very phonics based. Um, there's, you know, I see a cat, the, the book I was using it as, as an example earlier, there's a lot of rhyming um, CVC words. And I guess I, I have the same question as Amy, <laughs> you know, I think um, we need to see which ones are working better for teachers and librarians and parents. You know, I, I have a five-year-old and I've noticed um, just anecdotally, my daughter is seems to be picking up more sight words versus reading, uh, sounding things out, which is much more how I was taught to read. Uh, and so she maybe is an anomaly, but, uh, and she's yet to enter kindergarten. So I'll be very curious to see next year, you know, how her teacher is approaching it and what books she's using in the classroom um, and see if that's kind of matching the trend of other, what other publishers are doing. In general, Holiday House's readers are just so much simpler than the other publishers. So, which again, I think there's a real strength um, in that. But um, I, I think other publishers might be more willing to kind of follow the trends of curriculum, you know, what teachers are, are doing and, and Holiday House is more interested in focusing on the very most basic texts rather than kind of, because the truth is there are, there are trends that come and go in education. And like I said, like I, I learned to read this way. My daughter is maybe learning to read another way. And um, I think it's important to pay attention to that. But as far as I can tell, Holiday House is more focused on just keeping them as simple as possible, if that makes sense. Right. I've definitely seen the conversations about decodable um, readers on Twitter. And, you know, that anecdote I mentioned of someone digging me for saying it's out and ten minutes, but they said that's not decodable. And uh, my counter argument there would be it, it'll only not be decodable for a little bit of time. Because, you know, yes, the very first beginning readers need help translating the words into sounds. But once they've done that, uh, they're going to become more fluent with time. So if every book turned into a decodable reader, I think they would not have such a great reading experience after they got past that initial hump. So um, so everybody, I guess, will decide with depending on where the kid is, how they're reading, what their level is, what books write for them. But I think it's important that there be a variety of books for kids to be able to access so that as their reading ability evolves, they keep finding things that interest them and keep them reading. Do you both think in early readers um, within programs and without of programs that the art needs to reflect the text? 
right? Like in picture books, you want the art to sometimes not reflect exactly the text. You want it to add to the story. Otherwise, why is it there? But for early readers, do you feel that the art needs to reflect the text or can there be tension between what's happening in the art and what's happening in the text? That's interesting. I think like, we, I know we haven't looked inside Zuni Tales today, but um, it, it, I think it, as your reading ability progresses, there you go, um, you can begin playing around with that more. So I'm thinking of a particular page in, I think the, the second Zuni Tales book where there's a caption that says like many hours later and um, I thought it was a bit buried in the art and Vikram is, was saying like, well, I think the reader doesn't necessarily need to read the caption. They'll be able to tell, you know, what's happening in the art. And we kind of went back and forth and then he did make it a little more prominent. Thank you, Vikram. But <laughs> I think as you're getting to be a more sophisticated reader, both with the text and decoding art, which is a whole other kind of decoding, uh, you can play around with that, with the relationship between the text and the art more. But for Owl and Penguin, I, I do think um, the text really does, well, who's to say which comes first, except we know in this case, the art came first. But um, they really need to be saying the same thing. And I, I can't think of a case where, you know, there's any text or art and they're, that relationship is more playful. I think they're very kind of mirroring each other because it was important to us for a kid who can't quite read on their own to be able to read the story. With Zuni Tales, there's so much more flexibility because we're not focusing on that very, 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 very earliest age group. And so I think in an early reader, absolutely, yes, you can have the art be doing something different than the text. And it can be very, very fun. Um, but I think that is a challenge for, and, and it, 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 I think it can end up taking away from the confidence that you get from reading uh, one of your first books on your own. Um, that's my take. Right. Um, and you know, in, in my series, Bobo and Pop Up, you see that poster behind me. Um, there is no narrative text. All the text is in dialogue. So the art and the text has to work together. If you just read the dialogue, you wouldn't quite know what's going on. And if you just looked at the picture, you might not quite know what they're trying to communicate. So I, I guess it's a, you know, it's a, it's a gradient. There's books where, like at the picture book level, you want the story told through words and pictures because that's picture books are usually read by someone to someone. And so they can spend the time exploring both areas. And then as you're getting independent, you are at the stage where the text and the images have to mirror each other so that your reading confidence is bolstered. And as you progress further, they can diverge again and have more of an independent, you know, they're both independent uh, characters in the, in the experience. So I don't know that there's one answer. It's just, I feel, again, as kids will evolve, they will be able to uh, comprehend different kinds of content. Um, Anne is wondering, when writing animal characters, do you feel tied at all to the real life attributes of those animals? Um, I, I definitely uh, work in some of the attributes of the animals into the characters. Otherwise, why pick those animals? Right. Uh, if the if the characters are completely replaceable, then you, your characters aren't the unique ones for that particular instance and that particular story. Um, so I will, for in my books, for example, Penguin can't fly, but Penguin can swim, and I can fly, but I can't swim. So those do become attributes of some of the stories. Um, if uh, if you went if you stuck too closely. To the real life attributes of the animals, it might turn into a nonfiction book too. So it's just I, I like to have fun, and I think if you're creating a story, you know, it's what I tell kids: it's your story. Just do what you want. Uh, you can change things however you want them, but it's nice to have some consistency in there with what the kids know about an animal and what they're seeing that animal do. 
So we have just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to move through these last two. Uh, Susan wonders, Sally, if you could speak more about your role as an editor with early readers, with the text and the art, and if you find that you need to be more involved with line editing in early readers than perhaps other age categories. That's a good question. Um, I, I think working with Vikram um, is a bit unique just because he's so deliberate with his visual choices. Um, like you heard about the eye color and uh, I, I probably had less feedback on the art itself than I might um, working with someone who had put in, I mean, he spent six months re researching friendship. So it's like, um, you know, he came prepared. He did his homework. Uh, the art, I, I think what was important to me was communicating the story and clarity in the art. And so where I probably weighed in the most was especially in the, the endings of a couple of those stories, which were trickier, making sure that, that there was clarity. Um, and it, I mean, in terms of like line editing the text, this one really, it was more like line writing the text, which it, Vikram wrote it, but certainly um, I, I would say like, I think we might need text here, or I think we don't need text here. There, there were some panels where Vikram would add a caption and, and maybe it would stay there for like one or two rounds. And then later on, I might say, you know what, I don't think we need this text. It's definitely coming across in the art. Let's take it out, which is important to do as much as possible, again, because the goal was to be nearly worthless or something close to that. So, um, you know, there's not a lot to work with, but everything was very deliberately put in or taken out, um, if that answers the question. And... Stacy is curious about the trend in the industry for rhyme. Because rhyme is very common in early readers, especially. We hope it's a trend. <laughs> I, I'm so excited about Zuni Tales, uh, especially because Vikram's rhyme is so delightful. And given the simplicity of the text in Alan Penguin, it was really fun to work with him on such a text based book. Um, his first two books were, first two books were poetry collections. Yes, three. First three. First three books were poetry collections. So I knew he could do it, um, but it just wasn't part of the Owl and Penguin process. And uh, when, the, you know, it's a whole other story, but when the Zuni Tales dummy came in, I wasn't as much thinking about a trend towards rhyme, but what was very much present in my mind was we need some new things like Dr. Seuss. You know, there's a big push for um, alternatives or, you know, kids. There just hasn't really been an, a great example of someone who has established books like those um, in the early reader format. You know, there are so many, I think about Llama Llama Red Pajama as like a great example of fabulous rhyme. Um, but where do you, like kids who love Llama Llama Red Pajama are gonna love Zuni Tales when they're just starting to read on their own. Um, so I, I guess, I don't, there, there is another graphic novel in rhyme out there. It came out, you know, in between the time that we signed up Zoomy Tales and the time that it will publish. Uh, and we hope that there will be more because I think as, as kids are graduating from books like Owl and Penguin, um, graphic novels in rhyme are just such a, a natural progression and they're really fun to read out loud. Yeah, but I... I would say writing a novel in rhyme where the dialogue is all in rhyme is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I, I found it harder to write the dialogue, the rhyming dialogue for Zuni Tales than I did my poetry collections because you are trying to move the story forward entirely through dialogue and you want it to sound natural and not forced. I was, there would be days I would be stuck on the next line because I could not figure out how to phrase 
this what I needed to say in a way that fit into the format. So not easy. Rhymezone.com. I spent a lot of time on rhymezone.com, whatever the rhyming online rhyming dictionary is. Yeah. Well, this was really incredible. Thank you both so much. I just dropped into the chat um, a link to Island Books, which is uh, one of Vikram's local indies, uh, which has all of all of your books yeah. as signed editions, right? Yeah. So you can find um, you can find Vikram's books anywhere that books are sold. But if you're looking to support a local indie or if you're looking to give it as a special gift and you want a signed edition, I recommend that you check out Island Books and they would be so thrilled to fulfill your orders. Um, so Vikram and Sally, is there any last words you want to share? No pressure. But is, is there anything you didn't say that you're like, this is the one thing I should have said that I haven't said? No, Just for my daughter, oh, keep on reading. Well, my daughter is Vikram's number one fan. Um, so I would say, Outland Penguin, if you have a five year old in your life in particular, it is just a great read with a five year old. Right. And book two is coming out in just a few weeks. So look for that everywhere. You'll find the books and there's book one. Go. Best day ever. <laughs> Such a great title. Well, thank you both so much. And thank those of you who joined us, whether you're joining us because you're looking to create early readers or because you're educating yourself on how to share early readers and develop young readers in your lives, whether you're a teacher or a parent. When we give the gift of reading, there is really no better gift in the world. And so these books are a huge resource to those of us who are passionate about that. So Vikram, thank you so much for your work. And Sally, thank you so much for your work. And um, on uh, May 19th, we're going to be doing a similar live school visit. So if you're a teacher or a parent or you know classrooms, you can let them know that Donna Barba Higuera, who was last year's Newbery medalist and Pira Belpre winner, uh, will be doing a school visit um, with Samoa Live. And you can register and um, everybody's welcome and it's free. And so I'll be sending out more information about that via the newsletter and you can join us. And then I'm hoping in June we will have a summer reading event how to keep your kids reading over the summer, which books will be so highly engaging that they will be begging you to get them for them. Um, and so you can look for information about that. If you haven't subscribed, you can do so below. And we hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Thursday and a fantastic weekend. So bye, everybody. Thanks again for joining Thank us. You. Bye. Thank you.